Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video from Dr. Sean McDowell where he goes through five quick arguments for God's existence. I'm not hopeful that we'll see anything new here, but we'll give it a shot anyway. Let's go! How do we know that God exists? Well, ideally, God would just let us know. He's supposed to be our Heavenly Father, right? Well, I don't need to make logical arguments for the existence of my earthly father. I can just talk to him directly, and if you don't believe that he exists, I can introduce you to him. And you don't even need to believe in him before talking to him will work. So if that's how easy it is to know that a limited being exists, you'd think that an unlimited one would be able to make their way over this incredibly low bar. Well, buckle your seatbelts, because I'm going to give you five quick arguments for the existence of God. Again, the best argument would just be to say, Vice Rhino, this is God. God, Vice Rhino. And then let God take it from there. Number one is the universe had a beginning. We know this now from science, we know this from philosophy, that the universe began to exist. It's not eternal. That actually depends on what you mean by universe. Most apologists use the word universe in the way that cosmologists would use the word cosmos. The difference is that the universe is our current instantiation of the universe, whereas the term cosmos would refer to our universe and everything else that might lie outside of our universe. So our universe likely did have a beginning just before the Big Bang. Not necessarily, if the hartle hawking model is correct and space existed before time and so was eternal in the sense that as long as time has existed, so has space, but time itself is only about 13.8 billion years old. But this is only one of several models. A lot of the other models involve a cosmos that is essentially infinite in nature, or eternal, or doesn't have a beginning, whatever your preferred terminology is. So no, we do not know that the universe had a beginning from science. We suspect that the universe probably had a beginning, but then there are too many competing cosmological models to pin down with any degree of certainty what happened before that beginning. So whatever else you may say about the beginning of the universe, you cannot say that you know that it had a beginning from science. To do so is to ignore what the scientists who study the beginning of the universe have to say on the matter. Therefore, there must be a cause outside of the universe. And that's where the idea of a cosmos comes in. And there are many ideas of how a larger cosmos could result in our universe, as well as potentially a bunch of other universes. That's personal and powerful and intelligent, spaceless and timeless. Well, that's quite the jump. How do you know that this cause had to be personal? Powerful could mean different things depending on how you look at it. I suppose if the cosmic inflation model is correct, for instance, it could be said that inflation itself is rather powerful since it creates a potentially infinite number of pocket universes. But this isn't the same kind of power that I imagine would make a god powerful. Intelligent is as baseless a claim as personal, and spaceless and timeless could go either way, really. And I mean that pretty much literally if we're thinking of Sean Carroll's model, where entropy is essentially the arrow of time, and at one point in the past, entropy experienced a reversal, and since we detect the arrow of time through the direction of entropy, this reversal effectively reversed time, giving the universe both the appearance of existing eternally, as entropy continues eternally on in both directions, while also appearing to have a beginning at the reversal point of entropy. Now, generally, this leap in logic that gets us to personal, powerful, spaceless, and timeless is covered over with a bunch of sophistry that seems designed to confuse people more than enlighten them. But in this condensed form, it becomes rather obvious that this is indeed an unsubstantiated leap. That sounds a lot like God. Yeah, but not because that's what is logically indicated, but rather because this argument was designed to get you to a God, and so it was composed from the conclusion, working backward toward the premises. It's not like somebody worked out the implications of the universe having a beginning and was surprised to find out that those implications led them to the conclusion of a personal, powerful, intelligent, spaceless, and timeless being that had to have begun everything. It was literally the opposite of that. We think that God is personal, powerful, intelligent, spaceless, and timeless. Now how can we connect those to the origin of the universe in order to argue that the origin proves God's existence? The beginning of the universe points towards a beginner. Nope. 
the beginning of the universe points towards a beginning of the universe. We don't have enough data to draw any firm conclusions about the nature of what came before the beginning of the universe, or even if the concept of before the beginning is coherent in the first place. Second, what we call the fine-tuning of the universe. There are certain universal laws of physics and cosmology that exist on a razor's edge. And they all have one strange thing in common. If these laws of, say, like gravity were the slightest bit different, our universe could not exist. Eh, okay, but there are a lot of problems with this argument. First, we don't even know if it's possible for these constants to be any different than what they are, so it might not be chance or design that this is how they turned out, it might just not be possible for them to be any other way. Second, there is a degree of variability that they could have had that would still allow for life. For instance, here's a graph that looks at the strength of gravity and the strength of the electromagnetic force. Anywhere in the crosshatch section of the graph would allow for the development of life, and the little star there? That represents their current values. There is a nice bit of wiggle room on either side, and above and below it. Similar graphs could be drawn up for all the constants. And then to add to this, Third, it's entirely possible that all of these constants are not independent of each other, that the changing of one constant would have the effect of changing a bunch of other constants down the line, and with this in mind, there are a potentially infinite pool of potential universes that would allow for life. Fourth, we are only considering life as we know it. It is entirely possible that had the universe turned out differently, then it would not be suitable for life as we know it, but would be fine for life as we don't know it. Fifth, even if the constants are all independent and can have different values, we do not know that these values could have been just anything. It's possible that there are constraints on what they can even possibly be, and that those constraints happen to align with the values that would allow for the development of life. Sixth, why would God need to fine-tune the universe for life instead of fine-tuning life for the universe? As it stands, it looks like the universe is largely hostile to life as we know it, and so a small planet was made that would kinda work as a safe haven for life. Could he not have designed us to fit the universe that we're in better than we do? Seventh, if he wanted to actually have the universe itself show us that he exists, a more impressive demonstration would be to have the universe operate in a way that is completely hostile to life, and yet have life miraculously sustained in it anyway. And in this case, I don't mean hostile in the sense that 99.9% .9 of the universe will kill us pretty much instantly, but here we are in a tiny rock that kind of works for us. I mean that the universal constants themselves do not allow for the formation of stars, and yet our star exists, giving us life, where all our scientific research shows that to be impossible. Basically, considering all of this, the universe we have is the one that is ideal for hiding the existence of a god, because it's pretty much what we would expect if life in the universe were just a quirky natural development rather than a plan. So the universe, rather than being fine-tuned for life, seems to be fine-tuned for divine hiddenness. Yet they're all set right where they need to be to allow the existence and sustenance of complex life. No. They are set approximately where they would have to be in order to allow that, with plenty of variability that would still allow for that, and with further variability allowing for life as we don't know it, and without us even knowing if even more variability is possible. The fine-tuning of the universe points towards a fine-tuner. Not yet it doesn't. As with cosmology, in order for it to actually point to an external force making the constants what they are, we would need more information. And even then, saying that an external force had to make the constants what they are does not automatically get us to the external force being the god of the Bible, or even a god in the first place. Third, DNA. Do you know how much information is inside the DNA in your body? I saw one study that said the amount of information in one cell in your body is equivalent of about 500,000 movies. I'd need to see a citation for that. And I'd imagine that this depends on what we're considering to be information here, and how much information is the equivalent of a movie. You are saying that this section is about DNA, so I'm going to focus on that first. The information content in the DNA of one cell is the equivalent of about 1.5 gigabytes. The average file size for an HD movie is between 2 and 4 gigabytes. So for that comparison, there isn't even enough information in one of your cells for one movie. 
If, on the other hand, we're just going by the file size of a typical script, I don't know exactly what that would be, but the script from my last video was 14 pages and came in at 31 kilobytes for an average of 2.2 kilobytes per page. The average movie screenplay is about 110 pages, which would give us about 244 kilobytes. There are a million kilobytes in a gigabyte, so in the 1.5 million kilobytes of our DNA, there is room for about 6,200 movie scripts. But... If we extend our definition of information out to include amino acid sequences, there are about 42 million proteins in the average human cell, and the average eukaryotic protein is about 400 amino acids in length, which, if we're considering the amino acid to be the base informational unit here, gives us 16.8 billion bits of information in the average human cell, or 2.1 gigabytes. If we add this to the original 1.5 gigabytes from the DNA, then we now have a total of 3.6 gigabytes, so now at least we have enough information for one HD movie, but that still only gets us to 15,000 movie scripts. And on top of that, a significant part of information theory is figuring out compression. How can you express the information in its most compressed or efficient form? Considering the fact that transcribing DNA is how the proteins are made in the first place, it could be said that the DNA is a more compressed form of the same information that's contained in the proteins, and so one should not be adding the information contained in the proteins to the information in the DNA, as it is essentially the same information repeated. Now, all of that said, I actually have a really hard time grasping the concepts of information theory, so it's entirely possible that I'm just completely wrong and that there is a paper out there that makes this exact claim and explains exactly how they got there, but I'm going to need more than just Sean saying that it exists before I can accept it at face value. But also, even if that claim is true, there is a significant chunk of our genome that does not have any function whatsoever, but is still technically information. Mutations are a thing that happens, and a mutation in a functional portion of our DNA will, in most instances, damage that function. This is why duplication is one of the most important aspects of evolution. That way, a functional gene essentially makes a backup of itself with one of the copies now being free to mutate without impairing the original function of that gene. But if our whole genome was fully functional, this sort of thing would not be possible. Given the rate of mutation in humans, if the whole genome were fully functional, each couple would need to have around 100 million children in order to counteract the negative impact of mutations. That is, to have enough children survive into adulthood to at least replace the two people that had the children in the first place. When you run the numbers, in order to see what we actually observe in the human population regarding mutation reproduction, at least 75% of the genome has to be completely without function. Strictly speaking, this is still content that contains information, but if we're comparing this to movies, that would be like seeing a movie that's an hour and a half long, where just over an hour of the movie is nothing but a screen full of static. But also, 75% is a low estimate for how much is junk. A more realistic estimate puts our genome at only about 8.2% functional. So, in our 90-minute movie, that would be 7 minutes and 23 seconds of actual movie, with the rest of it being nothing but static. So keep in mind that when he says information, there are a lot of things that he could mean, and no matter what he does mean, he is ignoring the fact that a good chunk of this information is devoid of function. It's still technically information, but in the same way that the structure of a snowflake is information, rather than being information that contains some form of meaning, like the words in a book. That's half a million movies. Can you imagine? Now the question is, where does that information come from? It comes from the fact that Anything made up of baryonic matter, that is, matter that's not dark matter, will contain a certain amount of information. And actually, if we want to get down to that level, just ignore everything I said earlier. Hypothetically, one atom can contain several bits of information that could be measured in its various quantum properties. Practically speaking, the only thing I could find is that researchers have managed to store binary data in holmium atoms, so that's one bit of information per atom. There are approximately 100 trillion atoms in the average cell, so that's about 12,500 gigabytes of data, assuming an American trillion rather than a European trillion, which are different for some reason. So anyway, if we're talking about HD movie file sizes, that's still coming up significantly short of the 500,000. There's only space for about 4,200 movies now. But if we're talking screenplays, now we're up to 51 million, so we've way overshot the 500,000 goal. 
And of course, this is at the atomic level, not the subatomic level, where each proton and electron could be said to contain information. And all of this talk about how many movies can be stored might seem entirely irrelevant, but the point that I'm making here is that there is a lot of ambiguity surrounding what counts as information, how that information translates into what we might consider useful information, the differences in how information is stored, and a bunch more. We could even go so far as to separate a movie out into its individual parts. The original audio tracks that made their way into the final cut of the movie probably had bigger file sizes than the finished movie itself. Same with the video footage and the other assets that went into it. And do we even want to get into the information contained in the musical notation that is the score of the movie? Information is a huge topic with a lot of nuance. You can't just say, there's information here, therefore God. There's information everywhere, and the vast majority of it does not seem to require any sort of intelligence to imbue it with informational qualities can't be explained by evolution, can't be explained by chemicals or time. Why can't it? Whenever we see information, a sign that says stop, we say a person put it there. Maybe intuitively that's what we think, yeah. But if there's one thing that I do fully grasp about information theory, it's the fact that it's not intuitive. So just as the information in a book points towards an author, the information in DNA points towards a mind or an author of life. But what would you say if you were reading a book that was 75 to 92 percent just random gibberish that made absolutely zero sense? At the very least, you would conclude that this author was not a very good author. Fourth, the moral argument basically has two premises. Number one, if there's objective moral values, God must exist. There are objective moral values, Therefore, God exists. I reject both premises. For clarity, he's not got it formulated properly. Using his wording, it would be more properly stated as Premise 1. If there are objective moral values, God must exist. Premise 2. There are objective moral values. Conclusion. God exists. But both of these premises are flawed. For premise 1, I am unaware of any convincing argument that would tie the existence of objective moral values to the existence of a God. For a value to actually be objective would mean that this value is the case independent of the existence of a subject, where subject here is used with reference to a being with a mind rather than it just being something like the subject of a statement, like this rock is big having the subject of this rock. So for a moral value to be objective, it would have to be true even if no minds exist. Certainly there are deists out there who would argue for the existence of a god-type being that doesn't have a mind, but since I'm responding to a Christian here, I'm just going to go ahead and assume a god with the characteristics that Christians like to assign to god. One of those characteristics is a mind. So by definition, if these moral values are not true if god does not exist, then these values are contingent upon the existence of a mind the mind of God in this case, which then by definition means that these moral values are not objective. They are necessarily subjective, but God is a subject rather than humans. Which then leads us to the question of why God's subjective moral values are the moral values that apply to us. I've never seen this adequately explained. It's always either just an assumption, or it's an explained in terms that essentially break down to might makes right. God made us, so he owns us, so he gets to decide what is considered good or bad for us. Divine command theory, where something is right because the powerful guy who can torture you forever said so. So even though something is objectively harmful to our well-being, it can still be considered a moral good if God said to do it. That would be the stuff like condemning the LGBTQ community, where it has been demonstrated time and time again that acceptance leads to better outcomes in many different metrics. So. In this case, God's morality leads to objectively worse outcomes and more suffering than human morality. So I guess if we're divorcing morality from the consequences of moral actions, you could still say that God's morality is the standard for us? But I prefer to judge morality mostly by consequences, in which case being bigoted against the LGBTQ community would be immoral. Now how can we say there's objective moral values? Well, number one, it's kind of obvious. Is it obvious? How is it obvious? When you ask different people about moral issues, you get a plethora of different and often mutually exclusive answers. 
which suggests that their moral codes are not being imposed on them externally, but are internally generated. Sure, there are external influences, but even among people who agree on God as a source of morality, there will be moral disagreements. I can find Christians who are pro-death penalty and Christians who are anti-death penalty, pro-choice and pro-forced birth, pro-LGBTQ rights and anti-LGBTQ rights. If not even the people who agree that morality comes from the Christian God can agree on morality, then what makes us think that this morality is actually objective? We all know that torturing an innocent child for fun is wrong. Oh, there we go. Cue the montage. Oh, he's already in this one. Whatever, we'll play it anyway. That we know that it's objectively wrong to torture infants for fun. Every one of us knows that torturing an innocent baby for fun is wrong. Do we understand that torturing babies for fun is really wrong? So let me ask you this, Sean. If morality is truly objective, then why do so many apologists, yourself included, feel the need to add the for fun modifier to the statement torturing babies is wrong? It seems to me that this modifier is there to protect God from accusations of immorality when he does stuff like giving cancer to babies. That could be rephrased as God torturing those babies with cancer. But he's not doing it for fun, of course, he's just doing it to build character or some shit like that. The ends justify the means, which is an interesting position to take considering that Sean is an associate professor of Christian apologetics at the Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. And when you go to the Talbot School of Theology blog, you can find articles arguing that the ends never justify the means. Though, to be sure, disagreement on stuff like this among faculty members at a single university is pretty normal, so since Sean didn't write that article, we can't assume that he agrees with its conclusions. So let me just ask you, Sean, do the ends justify the means for God? Your addition of for fun in the statement torturing babies is wrong suggests that you believe that they do. We all know that, it's obvious. No, we don't all know that. I know that torturing babies is wrong. You apparently believe that it's not wrong as long as it's not being done for fun. So we both disagree on this issue. Second, in The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis said across cultures universally, there's common principles that everybody knows and lives as if they're true. Again, not really. There are some general principles that are found in most cultures, like that killing is wrong, but the details differ wildly. In some cultures, killing in self-defense is permissible, in others it is not. Some people believe that killing the enemy soldiers in war is wrong, others do not. Most cultures agree that rape is wrong, but there's a good deal of disagreement about what rape even is and who is to blame. And just to make my position clear, who is to blame is the rapist, not the victim, 100% of the time. Stealing is an interesting one culturally to me, because as cliche as the trope is of having someone steal food because they or their loved ones are starving, semi-recent social media posts have made it quite clear that a growing number of people would actively ignore someone that they see stealing items like baby supplies, hygiene products, or food, and might even run interference for them to make them less likely to get caught. So even for the big ticket items for which there is general agreement, when you get down to the specifics, there is always disagreement. Principles of honesty, principles of courage. Honesty is not universal. You'll find that many people think that lying is not only acceptable, but also necessary in a lot of situations. And while courage might potentially be universally admired, what is considered courageous will vary quite a bit. Coming out as LGBTQ is courageous. Depending on where you are, even just being an ally to the LGBTQ community can be courageous. I actually do get a lot of people who thank me for being courageous enough to be an ally, but where I live, being accepting is just the default position, so it's not really an act of courage for me to be supportive. I do have friends, though, who fly a pride flag in their yard while living in an ultra-conservative neighborhood down in Alabama, so they're being a lot more courageous than I am. But if you ask their neighbors to describe them, you are never going to see the word courage show up in any of those descriptions. And just as one more example, some people call those who dutifully showed up for military service when they were drafted courageous, while others call those who risked fines and imprisonment in order to stand up for their principles and dodge the draft courageous. All of this seems to be a matter of subjective opinion. There's nothing objective about it at all. 
principles of caring for posterity. You know, some of the loudest voices in the climate change denial movement are the ones that are very closely associated with religious organizations. So you'd think that if caring for posterity were an objective moral value that comes from God, they would actually be the loudest voices calling to protect the environment. Because even if you don't think that climate change is a real threat, I think we can all agree that pollution is bad, can we not? So calling for less pollution would be a good way to make the world a better place for posterity, would it not? Now the practice varies, but the principles are universal. No, these principles are not universal. On the extreme end, with regards to caring for posterity, there is a not insignificant group of Christians who are actively doing what they think will fulfill biblical prophecies in order to bring about the end of the world. They are actively trying to make sure not only that we aren't making the world a better place for posterity, but that posterity itself will not exist. You can't tell me that people like that feel the objective moral value of caring for posterity. So if there is an objective moral standard, and it seems to point towards God. I mean, after all, this points to a standard outside of human beings to a universal law that we're supposed to follow. It really doesn't point to that, though. The examples that are actually the most universal are also the ones that have the most obvious impact on human well-being. So to say that caring about our own well-being has to originate from outside of us is just completely nonsensical. There must be a God. No, if there is an objective standard of morality that is truly objective and not just subjective with a subject other than humans, then it must come from outside of God as well. Apologists will, at this point I'm sure, appeal to the idea of the objective moral law being God's nature, not God's opinion, so this is their solution to the Euthyphro dilemma. Is something wrong because God says it is wrong, or does God say that something is wrong because it is wrong? Well. God says it is wrong because it is wrong according to the nature of God, which is the standard by which we measure right and wrong. Which is just a fancy way of saying that something is wrong because God said so. So if there's a moral law, it points towards a moral law giver. Maybe. I mean, I haven't seen any evidence or arguments that support that claim outside of pure assertion, but even if I grant that, there does not appear to be a moral law. Not in the sense required for this argument, at any rate. And last, I think the reason to believe there's a God is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I feel like the only people who believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ already agree with you on the existence of God. I don't think I've ever met anyone who believes that Jesus was really raised from the dead, but that there is no God. Now, that said, the resurrection doesn't really prove that God exists. It would definitely count as evidence in favor of a God hypothesis, but there are too many unknowns regarding resurrection to say with certainty that a God was involved. And that's just starting with the assumption that it actually happened. As soon as you start looking into the evidence surrounding the resurrection, we end up at a place where we can't be reasonably certain that it ever even happened in the first place. Jesus claimed to be God in human flesh. He died on the cross. The tomb is empty. We have radical accounts of Jesus appearing to people. And there are first witnesses who are willing to die for this conviction. There is basically no evidence for any of that. Well, I mean, I suppose depending on how loosely you want to use the word account, I could agree that there are radical accounts of Jesus appearing alive, but there is no evidence that the information contained in such accounts is actually true. As to the witnesses being willing to die for their conviction, that depends on what you mean by witnesses. If we're talking about the people like the disciples who would have witnessed both the execution and the resurrection, then there are a grand total of zero reliable accounts that show them dying for their convictions. Even if we use some of the unreliable accounts, in most cases there is no documentation of them being given a choice between death and denying their beliefs. And if we're talking about the people who witnessed a post-resurrection Jesus but were not present for the execution, then we have Paul. So that would be radical account singular. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from James Henry Smith, who says, God's judgment is coming on the world and the atheists can't do anything but duck and cover. Well, James, if ducking and covering is all it takes to protect us from God's judgment, then eh, it must be a pretty weak God. God.
Thanks for watching. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, whose names I do not yet know, but the new ones will be thanked by name next time, along with any patrons who signed up before I switched the new names every video. But I don't want to accidentally dox anyone, so you need to message me if that's you and you actually want a shout out. And funnily enough, as much as it sounds like a bullshit excuse, the Canada-wide Rogers outage is actually why I don't have the new names right now. But anyway, thanks to my patrons, who are the people who torture the baby that is my channel for fun. If you'd like to be objectively morally evil, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vicerhino, or by supporting the channel in one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. I should also probably tell you to subscribe to The Watering Hole, because that's my other channel. See you next time!